Congratulations, you have found the Lambcast, the official podcast of the large association of movie blogs, also known as the Lamb. The Lamb is the largest collective of online movie blogs and podcasts with 2,000 members and counting. Every week on the Lambcast, various members of the Lamb community get together to talk about our favorite subject, movies. So bookmark the Lamb and follow us on social media. Be sure to join us each week to hear a lively discussion of films and movie-related talk from our members. Join the flock at largeassmovieblogs.com. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde, and Into the Heat of the Night were nominated for Best Picture, but so were Dr. Doolittle and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. The Graduate and Bonnie and Clyde were one and two at the box office, but Guess, guess Who's Coming to Dinner, Valley of the Dolls, and Thoroughly Modern Millie were two, five, and eight, respectively. Emily Watson, Paul Giamatti, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and Mark Mark Ruffalo and Jamie Foxx were born, but Vivian Lee, Claude Rains, and Spencer Tracy died. Gary Busey, Richard Dreyfus, or Dreyfus, Faye Dunaway, and Pat Morita all made their film debuts, but it was in The Love Ends, Melly of the Dolls, Hurry Sandown, and Thoroughly Modern Millie. Um, it was the year of Bedazzled, Belle du Jour, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and I Am Curious Yellow, but also the year of The Million Eyes, The Sumeru, Berserk, and Oh Dad, Poor Dad, Mama Sung You in the Closet, and I'm Feeling So Sad, which wasn't even the longest title of the year. That belongs to Marat Saad. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. In other words, it was a year like any other year. Hello and welcome to the Landcast, the largest association of movie bloggers. I am your host this week. I am Howard Kastner of Pop Art Podcast, Richard Kirkham, of, uh, who normally leads these discussions, had to be out of town. Uh, at least that's his story, and he's sticking to it. This week, we are doing the year 1967 in retrospective. We will, we will be giving a top five movies for that year. This doesn't mean our panelists will be choosing the best. They can choose any category they want, from top five films with left-handed actors, to the most boring films of the year, to the most unfortunate sex scenes with an animal. You know who you are. To the top five foreign films with maybe one in the English language, but I won't say who that last one is, because it was me. It, uh, and remember, it is a far, far better thing we do than we have ever done. It is a far, far better set of choices than we choose, that we choose than we have ever chosen. Our panelists include, sorry, Aaron Newworth from Out, if I get any of these wrong, tell me, because I'm often bad at this. Aaron Newworth from Out Now, Out now with Aaron and Dave, who was last seen giving a long-winded speech about how he has no right to interfere with his daughter's wedding, no matter the race of the man she is marrying. Out now with Aaron and Abe, and yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, next is David Brook of Blueprint Review, last seen being filled with a million bullets after stopping to help someone along a Depression-era back road. <laughs> Had it coming to the. <laughs> we we will maybe be joined by DM Anderson, David Anderson. Uh, we haven't contacted him yet. He's of the Free Movies Guide, and he was last seen stopping a wedding and running off with his love on a bus. And finally, we are joined by Tob Liebenau of. Okay, I can never remember the name of your podcast, Todd. <laughs> the Forgotten Filmcast. Oh, that's Some people right. call it Forgotten Films. So, you know, it, it gets <laughs> changed around. Whatever people feel like. Some people just forget. It. Oh, yeah. yeah now you know, I remember. It's easy to forget. Yeah. No, I remember. He was last seen wearing a sheriff's badge and carrying a black detective's bag to a train. <laughs> I, you know, I, I did not do a list of my top five films with left-handed actors, but because I'm left-handed, I would love to hear that list someday if somebody does it. But. <laughs> That would be fun. I'd like to hear the one with the unfortunate sex scenes with animals, but mm. <laughs> to each uh, his own. We will, <laughs> we will be going round robin. And so now I'm going to give you a choice. Do you want to do pineapple kiosk? 
even though it rarely comes up in these look back shows, or we can have both panelists talk about the same film they chose. And if the second f- person has a film they can add to their list, they can then do that. Which way, way would you rather go? I have a lot uh, of backups, so I'm <laughs> good with, with uh, whatever. Well, I don't, but I, I would say, you know, wait for the higher ranking, do the pineapple kiosk. I think that rule works, but yeah, I, I'd do that. I mean, I, I doubt there's anything going to come up, but, um, but yeah, I, I'd say pineapple kiosk. I think, uh, I, because I, I haven't prepared first, anything else. <laughs> uh, first, I have two questions. The, uh, to begin, were any of you born 1967 or before? <laughs> no, I was born in 71. So to that, I say, f- you, f- you, and the horse. <laughs> you <wrote on>. 82. <laughs> um, <laughs> next, I thought we would go around, and I have a reason for this, and say what we thought of 1967 as a year in movies overall. As you were doing your research, uh, what did you think of the year in movies? So we can start with Aaron Newworth, put you on the spot out of nowhere, a question out of nowhere that you weren't prepared for. No, I um, If I'm looking at the year as a whole, based on the research I've done for the movies I chose, my, my main takeaway is, wow, men, specifically white men, are the worst um, in all, so many cases. <laughs> Even like even Spencer Tracy's like, oh, I guess I am kind of racist. And Robert Redford's like, I don't know about this Jane Fonda. Like there's just a lot of like people that are making choices uh, that reflect poorly when I look at it now. Uh, I have a very specific um, theme for my list that I'll get to when we talk, talk about the movies. But like the movies outside of random observations, there's plenty of classics here. I mean, there, and there's a whole literal new wave of cinema coming into America along with you know overseas as well so there's there were a lot of fun options that i could go with as far as trying to like assemble what i wanted to do for today uh but because of how narrow my focus is i I got a lot of i got a lot of uh films of not much of interest happening beyond people moving around to different areas and kind of (laughs) things occur for to them um and I, i chose less plot specific movies uh, but uh, no, there's there's a lot of fun to be had here and a lot of just color and um, mm. liveliness and and things that are here that aren't as manufactured as they are today. And I, I really appreciated that for sure. Well, David, what about you? Yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting year. It's almost a bit of a transitional year. There are changes afoot. Um, and as you say, there's new waves moving around and uh, it's uh it, it's it's it, yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I've gone with a quite specific theme, kind of, but I've cheated a little bit. But we'll get into that later. But um, yeah, a, a real solid, interesting year for me. And what about you, Todd? Yeah, I, it's a unique year. It was a little hard to decide which way to go with things. I mean, like Aaron said, there's certainly plenty of classics that could be talked about. You know, movies that as I was developing as a film fan, people would say, "Well, you must see this. You must see this." Um, at the same time, you know, when I look over the stuff that's there, I mean, there's there's a lot of interesting things when it comes to foreign cinema. There's interesting things when it comes to like, you know, genres like the spaghetti westerns, um, you know, a lot, lot of different unique directions to go there. You know, things that are kind of a holdover from like the classic Hollywood, you know, as like Dave was saying, we, we're transitioning into, you know, what would we would see more of in the 70s. So, yeah, it's a unique time for sure. The reason why I brought this up, because there's a book by Mark Harris called Pictures at a Revolution, which I highly recommend. It's a history and study of the five films that eventually were nominated for Best Picture for that year. And its thesis is that the Oscars that year were, or in 68, but it was for 67 films, were a reflection and even symbolic of the war between old Hollywood and new Hollywood. And even though the final selection for Best Picture was a compromise between the two, it showed that the new Hollywood won, at least for a few decades. And then an old type of Hollywood comes back, but that's a discussion for another time. So he saw 1967 as a real, as you say, symbolic of the transition between the new Hollywoods. So... uh, this may be one of the most important years 
I'm not saying best or worst, but just important years uh, in Hollywood history. So let's go on with our choices. And of course, as you start, tell us why you chose that. And um, uh, I mean, what your theme is for your list and then talk about the theme and shows. So we'll go back in the same order. Aaron, take it away. Okay. Um, well, last time I was here for, what, 78, um, I went with films I had never seen before. And um, I didn't want to be boring and do that same theme again. That'd be ridiculous. <laughs> um, at the same time, I didn't want to also be boring and choose all these random classics like bonnie and clyde and shit you've talked about plenty so i decided instead to go entirely international with my list um i could say specifically new wave but i mean there's some films that are arguable here depending on what i'm able what i'm able to talk about uh, so i have a but i mainly have a lot of new wave films i tried not to lean too french but god damn it there's so many french movies <laughs> um so <laughs> I, um but so but instead of starting with french i'll start with japan um, I'll start with a film called Branded to Kill. Um, during the pandemic, I discovered Seijin Suzuki um, through a <laughs> film called Tokyo Drifter, a film that I am not sure how I got this far into my life without having known that movie, because it was, it was <laughs> so entirely up my alley in terms of everything it was doing, let alone immediately understanding all the things it was referencing. Uh, and so I'm like, there's what else has this man done? Because I need to see all of these movies. So I watched Brandon to Kill also very quickly after seeing Tokyo Drifter. And uh, this movie also rules. Um, I am a huge fan of a movie like this. I'm also a huge fan of directors that are told, don't do this. And then they do this. And then the studio is like, you're fired. And that's what happened with this movie. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Suji Suzuki is like, he's so experimental and absurdist with his style. Um, and, and not unlike, I don't know. Yoshimitsu Obano, who made Godzilla vs. Hedorah, who also got fired. It's like, no, I'm going to do the thing I want to do. And he does. He makes this crazy hitman movie where this guy who's like the number three assassin um, is put on a job. Things go kind of sideways. And now the number one assassin's eventually going to try to kill him. And that's that's like the basic plotting. But so much of this is dependent on like the weird of it all. Uh, the main uh, character, it's Gozagoro, um, number three. He um, has this, like, he has a, a fetish for um, cooked rice, like, <laughs> like that just turns him oh, on. Yeah. A weird, yes. uh, the kind of detail you expect from a movie like this. Um, it, he has, like, he has, like, a wife who's just weirdly sexual all the time with him. Meanwhile, he has, like, another woman that's hired him, and she's also, like, this psychosexual type character. Um, there's a lot of cool action in this movie. And when I say cool action, I mean, there's a lot of guy holds gun, shoots things. None of it seems real. Like there's reloading only when necessary. Um, the action is not like choreographed, like John Wick style. It's just more of like, yeah, they're, they're now an action scene. But there's like cool setups for it. Like there's a sequence where number one or, is like after number three or like one of the assassins is after number three. And he's... He ha he's on like a narrow bridgeway and he only has his car. So he gets under his car and ha there's like a rope with a hook on it. So he hooks the rope up to the car and then pulls the other side of the rope. So it like slowly wheels up the car as, as so he crawls under it to get closer and closer. There's just like inventive stuff like that. It's filmed in lush black and white. I got the new 4K from Criterion recently and it looks gorgeous. Um, there's a variety of themes in here. There's a lot of like dead butterfly imagery that's going on that's also like okay <laughs> that's, a, that's a choice um it has this i don't want to say bizarro conclusion because i've seen other films from this year uh but it certainly has a, a really auspicious conclusion as far as hey here's a here's a very symbolic place where we can end this whole thing and well <laughs> and it'll uh, take you in multiple directions um I, you can like seeing this movie after the fact that I've seen so many other movies, there is a very, I, I know where ghost dog got a very big inspiration from for sure. Jim Jarmusch's film. Uh, you can easily see John Woo, Park Chan-wook, Wong Kar Wai, even you can see a lot of inspirations there. The one that I found most interesting that I looked up is that Lupin the third was heavily inspired by this movie, which is like, that's awesome. <laughs> I love that. Um, so yeah, no, I'm a I'm a I'm a huge fan of Brandon Kill. I was really happy to watch it again in preparation for this. 
um, yeah, just a, just a real fun Japanese new wave movie. Has anybody else seen the film? Yes, yes, I, I love this film. I, I've not seen, actually, no, I haven't seen this one for quite a while, um, but I've seen Tokyo Drift more often, and I love that, and uh, yeah. I do have I do have very fond memories of Brandon's Kill. Have you seen Youth of the Beast yet? That's that's, no, that's yeah. very good. It's not as wild as those films. It's it's a, it, it was made before he kind of really went quite as uh, uh-huh. out there, but but it's kind of somewhere in between. It's kind of a, a really solid gangster movie, but with these cool stylistic kind of touches. Uh, so no, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm definitely with you on this choice. Absolutely. Great. I love the I yeah, love the actor this. as well. Oh, sorry, I was gonna say um what is it, Joe Shishido? He, he's in he's in loads of great Japanese movies. He's uh, mm. always memorable with his chipmunk cheeks. <laughs> um he I've seen it too. It's very, very weird. Uh <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. It did get him blacklisted for 10 years because the studio fired him. He sued the studio one, but he didn't work. Uh for um for 10 years i i did see his earlier films are more traditional they're very film noir take aim at the police fan i saw though i have to be honest by the time it was over i wasn't quite sure why anybody was taking aim at the police fan and i could be wrong but i thought he did one that was basically a japanese version of stagecoach Huh. Uh, okay. But it takes place on a bus. Um, and if I'm right, it's very good. I recommend it. I know there's a uh, sequel to this film also, a Pistol, Pistol of Opera, um, which I haven't seen, but uh, apparently has good reviews. So now I'm like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. And it was made like to recently. Watch. It was made like in 2000s. <laughs> I'm like, all right, he's up there. Okay, yeah, he had so, a bit of a yeah. resurgence in more recent years. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, oops, did you go back? David Brock, what is your theme? Okay, well, uh, I went with the clear because my theme is quite often all just random stuff from a collection that I've not watched. But this time, I mean, these are collection films from a collection that I've not watched. But um, I picked a more specific theme until the end, and then I saw something that was awesome and I wanted to talk about it, so I squeezed it in there. <laughs> but for the most part, for four out of five of these films, the first four, um, I am going to go with spaghetti westerns because uh, uh, looking through, I kind of made a big list of what I own that is from 67 and there were so many spaghetti westerns in there. And this was kind of a, a year when the genre was kind of full full flow. It was about to kind of die off in, in the next couple of years, but it, it was a uh, full flow now and there's loads of classic spaghetti westerns out there. So I thought I would stick with that. And I've, I've kind of mainly gone with ones I've, not, I've gone with ones with ones I've not seen before. So they're quite new to me. Um, so I'm going to start the the first one, the, the kind of least impressive one, but it's still decent. Uh, and that's a film called Ten Thousand Dollar Blood Money, um, or I think it's also known as Ten Thousand Dollars for a Massacre. I think something like that. Um, yeah, it's technically a Django film, although that might depend on the translation. <laughs> there's there's a lot just, of Django films out. Yeah, they're just, <laughs> but it's, there's no Franco Nero. This is uh, Gianno, Gianni da Garco. Apologies for the pronunciation. <laughs> And yeah, he's in town and um, he's hired by like a rich Mexican businessman to rescue his daughter who gets kidnapped by this notorious Mexican bandit who's played by Claudio Camasso. Um, but initially, Django's not interested. He's been a bit of a, uh, a dick around about it, really. He's he's not he's not been offered enough money. The, um, uh, the kind of the money he's been offered to do this job isn't enough. So he's a bit like, nah, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> uh, and he actually ends up the the um the out the bandit ends up offering him more money to help him uh to do a bank job so django kind of starts helping out this bandit and and getting involved with his uh crew uh so they have quite an uneasy relationship because you still feel like django might want to go and claim that money especially when the the rich landowner starts hiking up the the price so there's a nice bit of a a kind of a um play off between those um, and yeah, it's just a good, solid spaghetti western. Uh, you've got a bit of humor in there. You've got like Django shoots like a smiley face into a flask as a warning, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, you've got, as usual, it looks really nice. You've, you've great use of the wide frame, um, some nice camera moves. Um, there's a, cu- a few slightly unusual touches for a, 
um, uh, spaghetti western. Not that many, but like the opening shot is on a beach, which it isn't what you'd normally think of. You usually think of them as the driest, sweatiest films ever, and it opens on a beach, which is quite unusual. But um, yeah, yeah, it's it's decent. As I say, I quite liked. There's a few twists and turns to keep you keep you kind of hooked to the story, even if it's even if some of it is fairly generic. Um, and it's just yeah, good good solid fun time. So recommended if not one of the if not one of the better examples of the genre has anyone else seen it Wait, any, oh, i haven't seen yeah this. anyone else? i'm not familiar with it um so it sounds like something definitely to check out because uh spaghetti westerns are fun often they're fun because they're bad and often they're fun because they're good uh it's like film noir you don't necessarily watch them because they're great movies you watch them because you like that genre yeah, exactly. Yeah, I got this from a box set. It's, it's one I'd not heard of really, but um, Arrow released a box set full of. Um, they've done a few of these now. I think they've oh, done three. Okay. One of these box sets. This is the second set, um, mm. the Blood Money set, and it's in there. Um, and my next film will be from that set too. So <laughs> we'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. Okay, Todd, take it away. Oh well, uh, as I was looking through 1967, a bunch of the films that jumped out at me where I was like, I, I kind of want to talk about that film struck me as you know kind of being the type of thing that you might see at the drive-in theater so i decided to go with five drive-in movies and um, these kind of go across a bunch of different genres and the one that i'm going to start with is actually the feature directing debut of a filmmaker maybe you've heard of named william friedkin um this is the film good times which mm. uh Stars Sonny and Cher. This is the Sonny and Cher movie uh, where they play themselves. And essentially the idea is that, you know, I, it's trying to do a hard day's night with Sonny and Cher type of thing. But, you know, here it, the, the idea is that they uh, there's a guy, a producer that wants to make a Sonny and Cher movie. He's played by George Sanders. And so <laughs> most of the film is them kind of imagining themselves in different movie different types of movies as they try to decide what kind of movie they're going to make. So we see them in like a Western and we see them in like a Tarzan film and, and a detective film, things like that. Um, it's corny. This, you know, these are basically skits and they're corny, but the two leads are just so darn likable. And in, in a lot of ways, it's an interesting film to watch in terms of thinking about where Sonny and Cher were going to go in the seventies, you know, with this, the variety show success that they would have. I mean, that's something that was a big deal so much so that they kept doing it even after they broke up as a couple, uh, you know, so, you know, this, it, it was a formula that worked for them. And so here we kind of see the, the genesis of that. Um, part of the real charm of the film is that they have a lot of fun at their own expense. They're not afraid to look silly in this, which is something that works for them. And in fact, one of the things that's kind of funny about the movie is that, and this isn't really a spoiler, I guess, but at the very end of the movie, they decide they're not going to make a movie after all because they don't want to look silly. But the, the whole film has been about making them look silly. So I, I kind of found that fun. Um, but also, I mean, just in terms of this being William Friedkin's first movie, I mean, probably one of the most unusual things uh, in his career. Um, but I mean, he does a solid job with it. You know, he, he shows a flair for comedy. It's shot in a visually interesting way. I mean, it's really unlike anything he ever did. Uh, you know, everybody's got to start somewhere. And, and I think this is a, a really interesting uh, way to begin considering where his career would, would go. So yes, it's a very goofy film, uh, but I think it's very charming. So you didn't watch this and think this man will remake Wages of Fear at some point? <laughs> no, no. There's absolutely no indication <laughs> of things like Sorcerer or The Exorcist or the, the French Connection. None of that comes through in this movie, you know? <laughs> of all people, George Sanders. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I guess it means it's my turn. What I might you got actually for us, do a minor... Huh? What you got for us, Howard? Yes, but I, I usually do what I usually do. I just choose my favorite favorite or what I think are the best films of that year. So I will begin with Bedazzled, uh, directed by Stanley Donnan, written by Peter Cook 
and it stars Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. It's a retelling of the Faust legend set in, of course, the swinging 60s in London. A young man works at a Wimpy Burgers and he wants to ask his co-worker out, but is too scared to. So the devil offers him seven wishes in return for his soul. But every wish backfires on the young man, often spectacularly. Um, aesthetically, it's kind of dated. It looks very 60s, very mm -hmm. uh, sort of shaky camera documentary like look. But I think it still holds up. I think it's hysterically funny. You know, and remember the the secret word is Julie Andrews. So. <laughs> I actually just watched this fairly recently. I you know I've seen the remake many times. Um, many and, times. Uh, many times. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, well, it's one of those films that popped up on cable like all, all the time. It's like oh look, there's Brendan Fraser singing about the seals again or whatever that scene. I don't remember. But um, anyway, this film, I agree. I think it's it's. It's pretty funny, uh, though I do, would say it loses some steam in the third act for me. But I thought the the, the first two acts of the film are, are quite funny. With that, whoops, we are back to Aaron. What you got for us? Um, all right, man. By the way, uh, Stanley Donen super busy in the '60s. I was just looking at his. Because I, I looked, I was like, oh, yeah, the devil came out that year. But it's like, geez, Donan just didn't stop working. Like He was just no. constantly yeah. at it. Uh, my well, next the, film. Mm -hmm. I was going to say he was very big and very important in making musicals in the 1950s. And then that yeah. sort of died out. So, yeah, he moved into other things and made a lot of films. Yeah. It just, it just didn't hold him back. <laughs> He's like, I, I guess I'll do the musical thing, but I'm still going to, like, just keep making all, everything. Um, anyway. Uh, my next film is a film that I've I had not seen until recently. I've been wanting to see it. I wanted to see it specifically projected in 70 millimeter, which I almost was able to at the Egyptian Theater over in Los Angeles, uh, but I just couldn't make the time. But it is Playtime. Uh, oh, Tatis. sorry. Hmm? Pineapple kiosk. Oh, you know, you stop me right there. <laughs> yeah. We actually had a pineapple kiosk here, wow. so we'll talk about it later when I bring it up. All right, then I'll go for another French film, uh, okay. the young the young yeah. girls of Rochefort. Okay, nice. good, yeah. <laughs> another Jacques, uh, Jacques Demi. Um, I also had not seen this film until recently. I'd seen The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, uh, which I really really like. Uh, and now, why I didn't get to this sooner, I don't. I just I don't know. A lot of things come up, but it's like I I'm so into what. That he's doing as far as the, the way French musicals sound to me is just honestly just more intriguing than most musicals. I just like the way it sounds, um, you know, regardless of them reading the subtitles or just, or just listening to how it all plays out. Uh, and it just, I like the way, at least in these two films, he's incorporating music in such a, a frequent play, pace um, where it's obviously there are like set pieces or what have you, uh, but the way music just informs so much of the body of the film, I find to be just impressive and really enhances the world in the right kind of way. Um, as far as like the movies, I mean, it's gorgeous. It has just such a great use of color as I find most European films from before 1972. There's just such a, the way color looks to me in these movies, is just always like intriguing and fantastic. Uh, you have a number of people here. You have Catherine Deneau, you have, George Shakira is, uh, you know, playing an actual white man and not being put in brown makeup. Uh, you have Gene Kelly just showing up. He's like, why not? And that was a surprise to me. Uh, the the plot is more yeah. like expand. Yeah. You have also Francois Doriac, who is Catherine Deneuve's sister. Yes, you have the, the actual mm -hmm. sisters playing and, sisters in this movie. Yeah, and she died very young. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the actual plot is like more expansive compared to Sherberg, which is you know, it's, it's focused on two people. This one is like, here's multiple plot threads or what have you. Um, and like, I find the plot, like the plot's good. Like if there's nothing wrong with like the story and what it's doing, but it's just more of the style and the look of the whole thing. And just this constant, like it, five minutes in, I'm like, I'm going to like all of this because it just has a certain tone to it. Uh, that's just really engaging, keeps me just my eye on the screen and just watching all, you know, all the different dance numbers and songs, what have you with the, 
I mean, I guess it's a musical. Most of them are ADR anyway, but like, there's just the way the, the way you hear it, the way the sound plays in the way there's scenes of characters going through a whole dance number or what have you and walking around and then they hop into a car and drive off and they're still singing. Like there's just stuff like that that just feels really interesting to me as far as how to make a musical number work without feeling so pronounced in the way that you see them in a lot of Hollywood musicals. It just, I, I really enjoyed this movie a lot. So, all right. No, it's it's a really sweet, it's a really fun film. It's, it's, it was my but, first Jacques Demi uh, film and I, I love it. It's still my favorite. It's a, uh, it's, it's it's a wonderful film. It looks incredible. I, I do enjoy the songs. I, I actually ended up because I ended up I reviewed the the whole I went through the whole box set that Criterion did, and after that I went and bought the, um, the there's a really nice box set of uh, CD box set of the music hmm. that um that uh from his films that um oh my brain what's his name the guy did this the music for that um oh um, oh Michelle. <laughs> Michelle Legrand, he didn't do that, did yes, he? That, yeah, yes, that. Michelle Legrand, yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's the one. There's a really nice set with all the music that, that he did with Legrand in there, and it's, uh, yeah, yeah, another, another great choice. Uh, I think it also should be noted that he is married or was married because both have died. He died relatively young of uh, complications related to AIDS, but his wife is Agnes Varda, who's oh. one of the great French film directors yeah um uh todd's turn oh, it oh is and i think turn. it's, it's oh it's, no it's dave. Is it me next i think actually yeah. yeah oh who did i miss me dave dave, dave. <laughs> david brooke yes oh sorry i thought yeah, that okay. was you <laughs> oh no i was just putting in at the end of the <laughs> okay take it away david okay yeah so going back to the spaghetti western so as i say the, this next film is another one from the kind of arrow set of of kind of pretty random uh spaghetti westerns that i hadn't previously heard of but because i'm a fan of the genre i was like i'm picking that up anyway um but the next one is is, is interesting because it's it's not a sequel to uh ten thousand dollar blood money but it's um it's got the same two lead actors and kind of quite some vaguely similar themes so it's kind of a weird kind of semi-sequel to it and that's a film called vengeance is mine uh, otherwise known as ten thousand, oh, sorry, a hundred thousand dollars for a killing. So your budget's <laughs> gone up in this one. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, and um, yeah, this is a real another real solid western. So in this one, uh, again, we've got Gianni Garco is 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 our kind of protagonist. Uh, he's a, he plays a guy called Johnny Forrest, and uh, he is he's just come out of uh, jail. For, he's been there for ten years. And um, his his mother gives him a final wish in her dying moments uh, that he wa- she wants him to find his uh, half brother Clint, um, <laughs> and uh, and he, to br- she wants to bring him to justice because he's gone off the rails he's become a, a, a kind of a, a bandit and stuff and uh, he's uh, he's yeah he's he's a bad guy and uh, but she she pleads with him not to necessarily kill him says only shoot back if he shoots at you. Um, but Johnny, the the twist in this is that Clint is the one who put Johnny in jail for 10 years. So he's not happy with him. Um, but anyway, they meet up and uh, similarly to the last film, they end up having to kind of work together. He he does catch Johnny catches Clint quite early on and he kind of uh, keeps him prisoner in the the idea. The idea is to take him to justice, take him, to put him in prison. Um, but along the way, they they they're chased by Clint's uh, these guys that Clint has uh, double crossed and stolen this the titular kind of hundred thousand dollars, and he and so Johnny gets embroiled with that, and the two have to kind of work together to escape the other bad guys, and uh, and it kind of goes on from there. So yeah, again, it's got a nice kind of the central relationship is interesting, which keeps you watching, which keeps the film from getting it from getting tedious, and it's. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a good solid film. Um, it's also got some good set pieces. It's, it opens. The opening scene has actually got a bit of a horror vibe going on on it. And um, the um, these kind of bandits come in and John Johnny's uh, he's set these uh, coffins up for them and all this kind of stuff. And they're in this spooky spooky abandoned house in in the middle of the night. So it's got some it's got some nice little twists and turns to it. It's not not quite your standard spaghetti western, even though there's a lot of those kind of bits and pieces in there so yeah another oh also it ends it gets really pretty bleak and tragic in the in the kind of final act 
um, which I didn't see coming. And um, so it's got a more emotional heft than uh, the last film. So it's it's definitely of the two, uh, the stronger. But um, yeah, so I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it quite a lot. According to so, Wikipedia, this was the director's first film. Um, I, I, possibly he's not a director I know very well. Yeah, Giovanni uh, Farg, Fargo, Fargo. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, it says, yeah, it represents the directorial debut of Giovanni Fargo, also known oh, yeah. as Sidney Lean for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, it was a habit, especially the westerns. I think they 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 quite often change the names of the director and sometimes the stars to make it Wait, look as though it's an American Western. <laughs> even though it's Gianni, American. Gianni Garco is also Gary Hudson is like yeah, his yeah. American name. So. <laughs> yeah. Supposedly he chose that himself because he wanted a bit of Gary Cooper and a bit of, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, my brain. Oh, who's the Hudson? <laughs> anyway. Cliff Hudson is there. <laughs> no, no, okay. I, I, Rob, there Rob was, Hudson. Rocket, was, there yeah, I think yeah. that was the one. Um, yeah, and he was he was trying to <laughs> get a bit of both in there. Great. Well, Todd, um, your turn. Okay, so my next one that you might have seen at the drive-in, uh, I went for a kids' movie this time, a stop-motion animated film from Rankin Bass, uh, Mad Monster Party, which um, you know is very much in the style of their their Christmas specials that they're known for you know like santa claus is coming to town rudolph the red-nosed reindeer th that type of thing but this is a halloween themed theatrical film and um you know basically using kind of the classic monster characters uh you know dracula the werewolf frankenstein's monster the mummy dr jekyll and mr hyde that type of thing and just doing a kind of fun kids romp with with them and you know in a lot of ways it's just kind of a nice salute to those classic movie monsters though um you do have instead of the bride of frankenstein because they didn't want to get sued by universal they have the monster's mate which is voiced by phyllis diller which i could do without phyllis diller but <laughs> she gets old quick but um but i mean otherwise it's just it's a lot of fun very much aimed at kids uh written by folks that were involved in mad magazine and um also they they contributed to kind of the character design of things so it's got some unique kind of character designs uh to these puppets that they use for the stop motion it is a little bit jerky when it comes to the animation i mean you know the, the rank and bass stuff you know doesn't look the same as like the nightmare before christmas it doesn't flow with you know the the kind of graceful movements that they have in those films it, it was it you know somewhat crude but it gets the job done. You've got some fun voices going on. Uh, Boris Karloff shows up because Boris Karloff would always show up. Um, you know, uh, most of the voices being done by Alan Swift, and they're they're really really good. Um, there's some fun musical numbers to it, you, which also kind of nod to what was popular at the time in 1967. There's this band of mop topped Beatles inspired skeletons who. Nice. have a band called little tibia and the fibias which <laughs> just kind of <laughs> love that um so yeah i mean it's it, again you know kind of similar theme to my first pick there you know it's n not a great movie but it's kind of goofy fun and you know certainly one that's a lot of fun to watch around halloween time um and that the whole family can enjoy what i find interesting is actually the title isn't mad monster party it's Mad Monster Party. <laughs> yeah, there's a question mark on the end. Yeah, there's a question mark at the end. I kind of feel like I saw this when I was a kid. It's like the the name sounds familiar, but um, I can't remember. It was a long time ago. I, I've seen this poster, and I'm always like, I need to watch this, and I never got into it. It's streaming. Is it like well, available? I'm not sure if it is. I know for a long time it was kind of hard to get a hold of, and I remember. It showed up back when like Netflix first started doing streaming. It showed up on there, and you know, back when Netflix did movies that were old uh, on there. Uh, but um, you can rent it, but yeah, it's not like streaming free right yeah, now. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right now, it's not on any streaming services. It looks like my next one is a French film, uh, Les Samurai. Oh, nice. mm, good, written, pick. good pick. Good <laughs> pick. Written and directed by Jean-Pierre Jean -Pierre Melville, 
and starring Alain Delon. Melville was one of the big neo or French film noir, French noir uh, directors of the time. Um, this is one of his, his best movie is not a noir, it's, it's Army of Shadows, which is a World War II story. But this is perhaps his second best noir after uh, Bob La Flambeau or Bob the Gambler. And it follows two characters, a hit man uh, played by Alain Delon, who is trying to find out who hired him for a job and then tried to have him killed. And a Parisian, a Parisian commissaire trying to catch him. One of the funniest set pieces for me, I've seen this three or four times, is whenever you're in the police offices, the commissary just goes from office to office and office and office around in a circle. I'm going, well, that's <laughs> I get the symbolism. He's just going around in circles trying to catch this guy. But it's a very interesting um, piece of architecture. Um, I find it riveting. It's incredible to look at. It's very influential. I mean, you can see the influence in movies as recently as The Killer. It's it's a captivating movie. We, I remember we did it on uh, as a movie of the month a few years ago, and it was one of those cases where just everybody was just kind of just awestruck by the film. So. This was... Yeah. Um, this was my number one pick when I chose my theme, and I'm also like, this will probably come up, so I didn't want to like actually talk about it for my main <laughs> thing. Uh, there's no one cooler than <laughs> than Alan Don uh, in, in this year, let alone probably this decade. And this is a, this is a year that literally has a character who's named Cool Hand Luke. So I mean, <laughs> this Alan Don is so cool in this movie. Just watching him, I literally have it playing on mute in the background right now as recording this podcast. Like I, I love the summer. It is outside of like one or two other movies. It's my favorite film of this year. I think it's just wonderfully assembled. The atmosphere is terrific. It's probably my favorite Melville film, but yeah, Army of Shadows and one or two others are certainly vying for supremacy as well. But no, I, I think this movie is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's incredible. It was a difficult year for me to determine the five in order. And as you mentioned, Lee summarized your favorite. And yeah, I mean, it was our decision for me to where to place it. I think I interrupted somebody. Um, did I interrupt you, David? No, no, I was just agreeing that it's an amazing film. That's, that's all. <laughs> um, that was me. So we're back to Aaron, right? If I got this right, yep, am I you're losing good. it? You're good. No, you're, right. you, you, you lost it years ago. You're still fine, though. Oh, God, yes. Uh, Aaron, your turn. My next film, uh, I'm sticking with France. Uh, I'm going with Jean-Luc Godard's Weekend. Um, the, the A postmodern black comedy, I think, is like the way that like critics would describe it at the time. Uh, this is surreal, does not begin to ex dis explain like how this movie works. Have you guys seen Weekend before I just launch into this thing? Oh, yes. Howard has. I have a story I, I, about it, actually, about seeing it. All right, well, we'll get to that. But, yeah, this movie, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for, like, how... And I've seen Godard films. Like, I know he can make choices. Uh, but I wasn't prepared for, like, how just bonkers this movie was going to be. And I'm sure he'd love me saying, your movie was bonkers. Uh, but this yeah. <laughs> film, it focuses on, like, a couple. They're, like, a bourgeoisie kind of couple. They're on a drive to the wife's parents' house because, like, her father's dying and they feel like they can get the inheritance. And if that means murdering, like, the mom, so be it. <laughs> but at this, And also, like, both of them are having affairs with each with others. And so they're also thinking, I can kill my spouse and then I get the inheritance plus the lover that I've taken. Like, it's a whole thing. Um, and that's saying the plot is like, yeah, okay, there's a plot, I guess. The movie itself is like so much imagery here is presented in a way where it throws you off of your rhythm. Like just when you think you have an understanding, it just sends you further down the rabbit hole. And I say that very literally because Alice in Wonderland is a key reference point in this movie, a movie that's said in 1967 France uh, that has so much fantastical stuff in it. You encounter literal like French revolutionaries along the way, just hanging out in the grass or whatever, just talking stuff. There's a lot of car crash imagery in here, 
a thing that he might not have expected me to say as my next sentence, but that's true. Um, it, to the point where it's very gruesome. You'll have them just like stuck in traffic or like walking because their car eventually gets trashed, and you'll just like encounter these fiery car crashes and bodies strewn all over the place. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot more gunfights than you may expect for this movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a lot of um, because of the 60s, there's a lot of like title card placements that happen to break up the editing and like change up the momentum of the film. Uh, there, there are so many choices being made here where the first half is largely farce, uh, despite having kind of a sense of macabre to it. And then the second half becomes this like revolutionary screed where you have them encountering like these hippie characters and things happen from there that I won't detail just because I don't want to give too much away that's going on in this movie. But, uh, it's, a uh, it is a wild film that I, I was not expecting like how far it would go in, in kind of delving into the, the varying themes that it had about, I don't know, humanity and, and what have you. Um, knowing like other like, um, Godard films, like, uh, was it like breathless or, um, What's the what's the one that I'm thinking of uh, that just got released again? Um, the clown makeup. What the what am I thinking of? Um, uh, Pierre Lefou. Oh, yeah. Pierre Lefou. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus. I'm trying to think. Uh, like those ones, they felt less. They weren't throwing me off as much compared to this one, where it's like every ten steps, I'm like, oh, okay, I think I got her handle on this. Nope, never mind. It's going somewhere completely different. So no, I <laughs> I enjoyed this movie. I think it's quite interesting for sure, but it certainly caught me off guard as far as how avant-garde it would actually be well yeah he was a postmodernist before postmodernism really Trendy. became <laughs> the thing um i first saw it in college and i was already a godard fan but i have to be honest even though i was a big godard fan i saw weekend and i didn't get it <laughs> i didn't understand what the point was i didn't this you know whatever then i moved to los angeles and after a few years living in Los Angeles, I thought, well, I'll give it another try. And Weekend is a it, part of the satire of Weekend is that every weekend the bourgeois, the Parisian bourgeois, go to the country, and they're maniacs in how they drive. Mm-hmm. So I lived in Los Angeles for three or four years, and I go, oh my God, I get it because the drivers in Los Angeles are maniacs and they're just (laughs) as bad as the people in this movie. And finally, I got the joke. I understood what the joke was. And it's it's really, uh, yeah, that first half is really very, very funny. Uh, If you've ever lived in some place like Los Angeles where the drivers are just, you know, they need to be certified. And then it becomes very weird in the second half. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Anybody else seen it? No, I, I must admit I'm not a big Godard fan, but this is one that um, has always intrigued me. It, feel, it sounds like I should give it a try. It sounds wild enough to kind of uh, yeah. go for. It's got that going for it. Well, it has it's that road long. rage scene at the opening. That's very yeah. funny. Yeah, there's a, there's a good amount of humor in there that I, I was quite appreciating for sure. Yeah, and Godard eventually became a almost full blown comedian, a comic director uh you know some of the early ones like breathless and and um uh, the one about the three friends who it, break uh, into a house band of outlaws are much more serious and then he just suddenly did like alphaville and this one and pierre lafou and you're right he's just lost it thank <laughs> god he's lost it but he's just lost it um are we back to todd did i miss david again oh my god oh i'm so uh, sorry <laughs> david take it away okay so for for my next uh spaghetti western well i say spaghetti western but actually uh, there's there's an interview on the the disc that i watched um uh and the the director uh who was uh of this next film is called Dam- damio Dam- yeah damio damiani um, and the film is a bullet for the general. So this is a, a better known spaghetti western than the previous two. 
Uh, but he he in an interview he claims it isn't as western at all i mean because it, it's set it's actually set in the mexican revolution it's set in mexico it's not the american west at all and um, so which is a fair point but it's still widely I mean, considered by everyone else as a <laughs> so, <laughs> so i'm gonna go with that um but yeah it's 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 about a um a a kind of mysterious uh, American uh, played called Bill, uh, played by Luca Stell, and he he comes travels down to Mexico and he he ends up on the train that he's on. The train that he's on is uh, hijacked by a, a bunch of Mexican revolutionaries uh, led by uh, El Chuncho Munoz, according to uh, the IMDb. But uh, oh, Chuncho, I guess, is what they normally call him, and he's played by Jan Mia, Jan Maria Volante. So strong cast on this one. And uh, and one of his uh, fellow kind of gang members is played by Klaus Kinski as well, which is cool. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so um, and Lucas Stell, or Bill, he he infiltrates this gang. He kind of he fakes um, helping them uh, to get this train. Well, he does help them get the train, really. And he join he infiltrate, he befriends uh, Chuncho and infiltrates the gang. And uh, you slowly start to realise it never really spells it out until right the right towards the end, but you kind of get the idea that um, he's has a mission of his own, um, which the title kind of gives away. <laughs> um, but anyway, and it goes on. Do you want there. to give a hug to the general? <laughs> yeah, <possibly. laughs> um, but um, again, similar to, to the other two films, uh, the film really kind of plays on this relationship between these two characters. Um, Alex Cox even kind of calls it a love story between them um, because they become they become very close. Um, Chuncho really respects Bill, um, but he doesn't. But he can't, he's a bit blinded by what Bill is actually trying to do. So that's an interesting aspect. But one of the things that this really does that's uh, beyond kind of the a lot of the spaghetti westerns I've mentioned already is um it's a very it's much more political. It's a very political film, and you can tell sort of based in the in the revolution the, the the final line in the film is basically a call to revolution um in within the film um so it's it's got a lot more kind of depth to it um and it's it's not it's it's not as kind of overtly stylish as some kind of spaghetti westerns but it still looks nice it's got very good production design it's just very elegantly directed it's um, it does things uh more subtly than you might think in this kind of film as i say it doesn't necessarily spell out what bill is doing it is it is done uh, through how things play out through how things are shown and it's just a really a really 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 well put together film um it's uh, to be honest after watching this like, this is the first time i've seen it and um, i had heard good things about it but uh, i'm totally there I, this is easily one of the one of the it is top tier spaghetti western so i definitely definitely recommend this one um, yeah, as I say, political, uh, but still full of great set pieces, great performances, and uh, yeah, very compelling story. So, highly recommended if you've not seen it already. Okay. I like the fact that this Spanish title is Quien Sabe, which means who knows? <laughs> so, More subtle than the American one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the. Uh... The Great. director of the director of Amityville 2, The Possession. Really? <laughs> the, the better Amityville film. Correct. Yeah, he has the <laughs> Yeah, Damiani da, yeah, Damiani, I can't pronounce sorry, my <laughs> language is terrible. He's done some fantastic Italian films as well, actually. I, I saw a box set of his um some of his uh, crime films made in the uh, late sixties and and their and early seventies. They're excellent too. He's uh, he's definitely one to kind of dig out and look into his his uh, his work if you not seen them before great um well i think i have it right now is it todd yep yep it's me okay i got uh, it right <laughs> um my next pick is uh the trip from director roger corman oh, um that's a fun one written by jack nicholson um you know basically corman's attempt to cash in on the the LSD craze, uh, it, you know, basically you've got Peter Fonda playing a guy who's struggling through his divorce. He has a buddy played by Bruce Dern who takes him off to meet <laughs> guys up that have never taken. Hippies. Exactly. Well, just wait. They take him off to meet up with a bunch of hippies, including 
Dennis Hopper, and oh. then Fonda ends up having his first experience with LSD. Um, it It's a slim story. I mean, really, the story just kind of is there to give Corman a chance to string together some wild visuals, and quite frankly, that was enough for me. I think he does a really great job with it. And, you know, it, it's kind of interesting the way the film goes between some kind of playful situations that are kind of light and cheery. And then the trip kind of goes bad and things get kind of dark and sinister. Uh, you know, so you get plenty of kind of, you know, that typical sixties psychedelic imagery, the whole kind of lava lamp look, that type of thing. Um, got lots of music from electric flag. And, and I think Corman does a great job of kind of bringing the visuals together with the music in a really uh, interesting way. Um, good performances all around. Uh, Fonda's really solid. I think I like him better in this than even in like easy rider. Uh, Hopper, of course is Hopper. Yeah. So he's a lot of fun. Um, but, uh, I mean, basically, I guess Corman, uh, the, the legend has it that he researched this by taking LSD himself and, um, you know, not a life choice that I would endorse, but I think <laughs> when it comes to the films that I've seen that Roger Corman directed, this is one of the best. I mean, Corman's got a long and unique career and there's some films in his, uh, filmography that he directed that are really good and there are some that are you know just churn it out quickly and make a few bucks this one is really good i did like movies with the trip in the title so i will check this out for sure when i get a chance (laughs) yeah it's not a great film but it's a very entertaining film it's kind of an important film for the time because it's about the counterculture and about someone who takes lsd and doesn't get Punished for it. Mm-hmm. It was written by Jack Nicholson, and there was a documentary on Roger Corman, and they were talking to Jack Nicholson, and Nicholson started crying because he said nobody wanted me, nobody would use me, and then Roger Corman would let him do just about anything he wanted to do, and because of that, now Jack Nicholson is a huge big star, uh, and he wrote this one, and he directed some others, produced others. And uh, this was a major stepping stone. For yeah, and this is coming the year before, too. I mean, Nicholson has two films that are kind of, I mean, really oh, yeah. trippy when it comes to, you know, the their themes and visuals and such that he wrote. Uh, you know, this comes 67 and then 68. Uh, he writes Head for the Monkees, which is also a, a crazy film to take a look at. But doesn't he do the shooting this year as well? When is the shooting? I don't <clears throat> remember. Which is a really... Oh, it's 1966. Yeah. Year before. Yeah. 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 And that's that's a really good Western. Um, it's a low-budget Western that, you know, that's uh, very clever. Oh, I think it's me, is it? Yep. Yes, it is. Yes. So... I am going to go to, uh, sorry, I have to go all the way down here. Um, nothing that's too surprising, but it is one of the most important films of the 1960s and uh, uh, the history of film in America, and that is Bonnie and Clyde, uh, which I, again, saw in the last couple of years because we did we covered it for uh, my podcast, Pop Art. It's directed by Arthur Penn, and it stars Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway with a screenplay by David Newman and Robert Benton, and in it, Bonnie Parker's board waitress falls in love with an ex-con, Clyde Barrow, and they start a violent crime spree through the country, Depression era, era Oklahoma. Uh, it actually only lasts a couple of weeks. Uh, it seems long that it lasts over longer, but they were only... Uh, outlaws for like a couple of weeks before they were stopped and killed. And it is a romanticized view of the pair. They change some things from history to make them more likable. But it's very entertaining. It's very well done. It is one of the most influential films of the 60s when it comes to how violence and how anti-heroes become big uh, after this. And it helped bring down the code. Movies like this just, you know, the code couldn't handle them. And they were very popular. It's a huge hit. Um, 
I mean, I love Bonnie and Clyde. It's a fantastic mm-hmm. movie. On out and right. out there, and we did a whole commentary track for it. It was fascinating to just talk about for you know an extended period of time. The I, I love the choices it makes uh, to not necessarily subvert things, but certainly add a different, an interesting dimension, like making uh, Warren Bate making Clyde uh, impotent. That's just for a movie like that that could have a lot more freewheeling sexuality going on that's an that's a choice that reflects like the fact that clyde was perhaps gay uh, or what had like they just kind of struck down the middle it's like what if he's impotent just we'll see where that does, takes us uh, the the brief scene with gene wilder and the um oh yeah the woman, he's great. The woman he's with that's just wonderful like especially like i seen the, i'd seen this movie after i just known gene wilder for being gene wilder and the, okay, i get that this is the same year as like the producers but watching him just pop up in this. I'm like, Gene Wilder's in this movie? And it's just like such a, it's such mm-hmm. a like weird joy to see him. Like he's not playing a comedy character, but he's certainly like, you can look at his reactions and see him as comedic, but it's also like, it's a very serious segment of the film because you're, you have these cut, this couple going from, I guess we're all on for this ride to, we are horrified by this. Get us out of here, please. <laughs> and it's just a, <laughs> a, a change in mood. And then Gene Hackman's in this, which doesn't get enough credit. Yeah. Either. He's like, he's yeah. so good. Yeah. Was he nominated for this? I forget. Was he? Yes, uh, there were five acting nominations. Yeah, for there's this, like a ton, you know, right? So like, yeah. Still Parsons won. Yeah, exactly. She's the one. <laughs> the one. And and he's and he's so good also in this. The whole movie rocks. I, I, Bonnie the Red is just a great film. The um, the interesting thing about the impotence is that in the original screenplay, he is gay or bisexual. Uh-huh. And Michael J. Pollard, and I think the, actually the story makes sense, more sense if you know that, because the pickup of Michael J. Pollard doesn't quite convince. But what what the basic idea is that he and and Bonnie would would pick up blonde bimbos, himbos, and uh, have three ways with them. But as but two things happen first. I think uh, I can't remember who it was, whether it was the director or was Warren Beatty goes to the writers and said, you know, the American public has no problem. Find, will have no problem finding a hero in this murderer and bank robbery. They'll never forgive him for being gay. That sounds so, like uh, well, but he was perhaps right because this was the sixties and yeah, in, in America. And uh if you did try to make him, it's just, you know, that that's the way the time was. And as I said, the picking up the Michael J. Pollard part makes more sense if he's part of uh, their picking up for sex. But as Vito Russo said in Out of the Closet, once you cast Michael J. Pollard in that part, well, there's no way, you know, that plot turn can be convincing. I mean, that just put the kibosh on any possibility of that. Um but yeah, uh, uh, Francois Truffaut interviewed Warren, I think, talked to Warren Beatty about making the film. So did Godard. Um, I can't remember which one of them said it, but after meeting Beatty, they said, no, we're not going to touch this film as long as he's in it. He just had a massive ego. At any rate. It worked out. Uh, I think we're back to Aaron. <laughs> we did. We are. But the, the the film ended up being a hit. Proved everyone wrong. Um, huh? the, the the movie ended up being a hit and proved everyone proved a lot of people wrong. That's far, or at least it was popular with the kids. That's more the the way to go. <laughs> oh, it's a huge hit. It was huge. Especially at first, it didn't. It got terrible movie reviews. Yeah, okay. Except and Ebert. Ebert was all out. about it. Ebert was like, "This movie rules. You guys are ridiculous." Uh, <laughs> so thing. did Paul and Kale. Paul yeah, and Kale's yeah, yeah. review really helped. So they re-released it, and that's when it became really, really big. So, mm-hmm. and they get all the Oscar nominations, and was, I think, number two at the box office. Graduate, I think, it was number one. Graduate was, yeah, graduate was, by, like by far, it was a huge hit. Um, my next film is uh, I'm going to move away from France for a bit. I'm going to go to to sw- to swing in London uh, for Poor Cow. Um, a, a film that I've been wanting to see since every time I watch Steven Soderbergh's The Limey, which uses clips from Poor Cow to reflect Terrence Stamp's early life, which I always thought was a clever bit of thing, even though I hadn't seen the actual movie that this is from. Um, 
I'm not going to say that this movie is way different than what I expected it to be, because I'm like, ah, it's a 67 Ken Loach film. I'm, I'm sure it's probably not going to be a, a, a super cool heist flick with Terrence Stamp or something like that. Uh, but it is, in fact, a, a very much a Ken Loach's debut film, for one thing. Um, but it certainly fits with the other Ken Loach films that I've seen as far as being this like depiction of socioeconomic struggles and class structures and how some people try to fiend for themselves despite everything going on around them. Um, it ha- Carol White is like the true star of this movie. Terrence Stamp's in this for like the first act. And he's very good. He's Terrence Stamp. He's fun to watch. Um, but she plays this mother who has like an abusive husband who's like into crime and then he goes to jail. Terrence Stamp comes in as he's like one of the husband's friends um, and he's just a much kinder person. But then he goes to jail, too, because crime. Um, what are you going to do? And so she's stuck in this position where she has to, like, make money for herself. And she's, like, a barmaid or, like, a model. She She's too much of, like, a, a swinger herself. So she doesn't want to go into, like, the life of a prostitute, which, like, the aunt that she lives with is, like, an aging prostitute. There's a lot of stuff here, but it's like, oh, man, the 60s. Um, the movie of the movies I watched for this, this is probably the least impressive to me, but I still found it to be interesting, interesting as a watch. Um, certainly because of, I, I was curious what like a Ken Loach film from many, many years ago compared to the films I've seen of his of late, uh, looked like, and I was like, oh, it's, he hasn't changed much as far as what he's, but that reflects more of, uh, the, the populace that he's going after and, and not opposed to his filmmaking style. Um, there's a Donovan score in this movie, which is nice. Um, the the look of London at the time, I mean, it looks like compared to other like swing in London movies, um, like I don't know, Blow Up. Uh, this movie is so much more gritty and real, um, in a way that is you know fairly depressing at times. Uh, but the as a drama. It, it's fine. It, it works well enough. I think the performances do the do so much of the work to make this movie like overall you know, work as a as a recommend from me. But in terms of what it's after, it's like yeah, this is just a lot of nowadays. It would be this like a two four misery porn drama. Um, this as it stands is like yeah, all right. It's not as I don't know, transgressive as the other like new wave films that I've been talking about, but it works as an uh, efficient character study that happens to have really good performances in it. Not seen it. So when I always say, I'm going to see it, I'm going to see it, I'm going <laughs> to see it uh, along with Kess, and I never end up seeing it. So I've seen a number of his other uh, films. It came at the end of the kitchen sink, yeah, uh, working class. Uh, dramas with, which stopped once swinging swinging London took over the economy got better and London was the center of everything uh, stylistically and thematically and people didn't want to watch the uh, the depressing kitchen sink movies anymore and we now got the swing 60s in London so yeah it was sort of like you know but he managed to keep making films as you say without changing much over the years he's always been with the working man he's always been with the poor he's always been a socialist or a communist Mm -hmm. Um, and he never really has changed no i must admit that's partly why i'm not a big ken loach fan i do love kez i adore kez but anything else i've tried to see from from ken loach i've just struggled with i just find him a bit heavy-handed and he just kind of putting out the same spiel i don't find him a very interesting uh, director as such but as i say he often has good strong performances in his films so they're quite often watchable but i do struggle but cares though gets me every time I, it's uh, yeah it helps that it's set kind of not a million miles away from where i grew up uh, up, up north <laughs> and uh yeah but but i Paul is not is one i've not seen actually so um it's one i, I keep being tempted by but because of my hit and miss of kind of relationship with Ken Loach, I've, I've avoided it. Here's the so thing about moving, Ken Loach. Moving furniture in the background. <laughs> uh, no, there's some work going on in my house, oh. and it's Mike's picking up more than I thought it would. Oh, uh, yeah. The thing about Ken Loach, though, hilarious guy. Tells jokes all the time. Funny part. <laughs> no, made that up. Not true. It's probably really boring. <laughs> I, I think that, yeah, I, I, I like Ken Loach. 
his films don't often rise above what they are. Uh, so actually, I think Mike Lee works much, much better for me. Sure. Yeah, same here. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I've always wanted to see that. I've always wanted to see Casson for whatever reason. Uh, David, this time I got it right, right? I didn't skip you? Yes, you got me right. <laughs> it's your time. turn? <laughs> it is my turn. Ah, victory. My memory's <laughs> coming back. Well, I, as I, I mentioned earlier that I didn't pick five um, spaghetti westerns, so this will be my last spaghetti western. And uh, this is uh, Faccia a Faccia, uh, otherwise known as Face to Face. Uh, so this is by Sergio Salima. And it's it's one of three films he did with uh, Thomas Millian, uh, the others being uh, Run Man Run and the most famous of the three, which is the big, big gun down. And uh, it's it's a fantastic trio of films, really. And, and this this stands up to those. So um, it, it, it begins it, 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 unusually. It begins in a classroom and you have a history professor uh, giving a lecture to some kind of young men. And he um, it, and what happens is this. He he is very poorly and um, he believes he's dying. And uh, <laughs> and this. Uh, this teacher, he's played by Jean Maria Vol Volante again, and uh, he he because he's he, because of his ill health, he has to retire early, and he moves to Texas um, because the heat, the sun is supposed to make him feel better. And whilst he's kind of lounging around uh, in Texas, he ends up being taken hostage by a notorious bandit uh, played by Thomas Millian, and. <laughs> Weirdly, all these spaghetti westerns I seem to have been watching from this year have a similar thing going on where you have this weird relationship. It's a kind of a, an odd couple relationship. Um, but what this film does, um, again, it's quite political. And uh, what this film, it's all kind of about uh, power and ambition. And what happens is this, uh, this weak, uh, or initially very weak, uh, timid uh, history teacher, he ends up kind of getting involved with this gang leader. He he starts to enjoy the thrill of this of this life and and realizes that he can get lots of money and power by doing these horrible things to people. And so the film is about a kind of both the characters turning. Supposedly Slima got the idea after his experiences in World War Two or um of the idea of a, 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 an a, an unusual incident, a dramatic incident totally changing the personalities of someone so this looks at how um thomas millian who's a, a, at the start of the film just a, a, a selfish mean bandit who's just killing to get money um him kind of mellowing whilst this history teacher who wouldn't say boo to a goose becoming really really evil by the end of this film and uh it, it kind of it plays on that a lot and and this is another film that um like bullet for a general i was very impressed by definitely upper tier um uh, spaghetti western one, once more uh, it's got some uh, very sharp editing um i think that you get that a lot in Sergio Salima's films um some nice match cuts uh, some really nicely blocked out sequences with a nice bit of camera movement and framing you've got an Anaya morricone score which is always welcome mm. um so yeah this this i i loved it i really really enjoyed this a lot so yeah a, a nice quartet but definitely the these last two were the ones that stood out for me I was wondering why Salima sounded so familiar, and he's, he's the father of Stefano Salima, who directed the Sicario sequel, among other things. Oh right, <laughs> I didn't know that. But he's but done a lot of he did a lot of Italian genre movies. Um, he's he's quite famous <laughs> for doing some um, stuff like that. What I sort of find interesting about spaghetti westerns is that it's it's a genre that it's sort of like film noir that fans of them will watch. All film noir. It could be mm. terrible and me not. There could be one scene in it, and that's the main reason to see it, because you just like that genre and you have it for uh, spaghetti westerns, you have it for Gaio films, you have it for samurai films in Japan. There are just sometimes these genres that someone gets fascinated by, uh, and for whatever reason. And I like the fact that you mentioned that, you know. Uh, the World War II and everything. I mean, so many spaghetti westerns are anti-capitalist and anti-fascist mm. and pro-individual and pro, uh, you know, 
you know, just anti that. And it makes sense with World War II and the rise of the mafia that you have these spaghetti westerns that are doing nothing but attacking uh, these kind of, you know, fascistic organizations. Yeah. But I can see why. Hmm? And with what was going on in Italy at the time, I guess it was kind of bubbling up and there's there's all the violence and things they had in the 70s that had come soon after the spaghetti western boom and, and the cinema changed with that too because uh, you ended up moving away from spaghetti westerns and into the Polizia Tesci uh, films the kind of cop cop movies um they, they quite often do reflect what was going on in Italy at the time so it's, it's it's always interesting to see they even if they're dismissed as kind of genre movies that they because Italy had a, a tendency to find a genre that's popular and just ride it to death <laughs> like they do they made hundreds of these in the space of just a couple of years um but yeah as i as i learned going through a bunch uh this this last couple of months is uh there's some there's plenty of gems in there plenty of gems but but like you mentioned i am i'm on these people where there's certain genres are just i i still enjoy watching them regardless for me westerns in general i i, I do love a good western I'll, I'll stick on any um and film noir, in fact, and martial arts movies, as, as most of you know, if you've heard me on this podcast before. Was um, was face to face in a box set, or how'd you how'd you watch it? Oh uh, no, this is uh, this is one I I just had on DVD. It's uh, it was released yeah. by Eureka a long time ago, but I think it's out of print now. So I'm not actually sure how to get hold of it these days. That won't stop um, me. I'll find it. But yeah, but yeah, Eureka did. <laughs> Eureka put it out on DVD. That it's not had a Blu-ray that I'm aware of. Not in the UK, at least. Uh, but it's well worth checking out. I enjoyed it a lot. We really want to know what's going on underneath the surface of a country or, for example, in America, what led to the 60s. You don't go to the big budget no. films. You go to the B films. You go to the film noir. You go to the sci-fi horror films. And you go to the revisionist Western or psychological Western ones, the B films. The B films will tell you how people are really feeling Absolutely. in a country. Yeah. You, 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 uh, didn't go, you didn't go to Dr. Doolittle to find out about America's obsession with top hats and animals? <laughs> <laughs> um, Todd. Well, speaking of B films and uh, and also genres that were run into the ground, uh, you know, at the drive in, a lot of times you would see biker films. So uh, we're going to go to the film that introduced Billy Jack to the world, The Born okay. Losers, um, <laughs> released by American International Pictures, of course. Um, the credited director is T.C. Frank, though that's just an alias. It's Tom Laughlin, the star uh, who played Billy Jack and would return to that character several more times. Um, the film is about a biker gang called the born losers who are terrorizing the poor citizens of Monterey, California. And, um, they end up crossing paths with Billy Jack. And of course that doesn't go well for them. Billy Jack is of course, uh, he's a half Indian green beret, Vietnam vet. And, uh, you know, he doesn't like to see, uh, people uh, get roughed up and he steps in to to take care of things and this actually gets him into trouble he gets thrown in jail trying to do the right thing um and then when he gets out he he goes back after the uh, the the bad bikers and all that kind of stuff um I, it's a film that has a lot of the kind of mayhem and such that you like to see in a biker film but you know there's a bit more to it as well i i, I one of the things that stuck out for me with this is just the, the colorful characters, uh, you know, the, the biker gang for one. But I mean, Billy Jack, Billy Jack is just such a cool character. I, I totally get why Tom Laughlin latched onto this character and kept wanting to play him as many times as he could. I mean, he made three more movies as Billy Jack. And there's a fourth one that I guess I don't know how far into production he got, but it didn't get finished or whatever. But he loved the character. And that comes through in this. It, it's a cool character. Um, the the film in general is just a unique look into the biker gang culture. Uh, it's got good use of locations. I, when it comes to, to biker films, this is one of the go-to movies. And uh, I mean, I, I actually, I had seen the follow-up film first. And I will say, I think that the 71 sequel, which is just called Billy Jack, is a better movie. 
but the born losers seeing where it started still a, a very entertaining uh entry in the biker film genre but the bike billy the- jack i saw it when it came out that's one of the few films uh that i saw you know when it came out and uh, it's very entertaining it's not very good but boy it was entertaining it made a lot of money and People my age, teenagers, really loved it. The the biker film genre seems like such a bygone era of film, like more so than westerns, more so than, like film noir is just like there's an obvious like, and even that's kind of comes back with neo noir every so often. Biker film seems like such a very specific time and place where mm-hmm. I don't know if like youth of today, I'm not that old, youth of today will watch, <laughs> will like think of the idea of, there was a time when there was a genre to, just focused on people on motorcycles, that was a thing? Like, that seems like such a, a curiosity by comparison to other <laughs> film genres that exist out there. Yeah, yeah. I think that's very true. I mean, we still, we had the television series um, Sons of Anarchy? About the bikers. Huh? Sons, Sons of, of Anarchy. Anarchy. And we'll find out how well it does when what's the movie that's coming out? The, the Bike Riders, uh, Jeff Nick Jeff Bike Nichols. Riders. We'll see how yeah. well that does the box office. But even then, that's like more, you know, art house character drama that happens to be a better right. movie, as opposed to right. the whole thing is these are guys and they're on bikes. There's a plot. Like that's that's like the extent <laughs> of the genre. Well, that's postmodernism for you. Take the really the B films, the exploitation films, the grindhouse films. And 20 years later, you make A films, you make art house films out of it. And yeah, that's, that's what, what that, is. And that's what I was saying about like at the at the at the top, as far as watching 67 movies, there's a lot of just the plot is so inessential, and it's largely groups of people gathering to either argue, talk, or banter with each other. Uh, and then they move to another scene and do the same thing. Like there's so little, there's so much aimlessness, and it's not a flaw, that's just how a lot of these films function and it's fine where nowadays people complain so much about story and it's like shut up <laughs> like, just, like, <laughs> there's so many other, there, there's so many things that go into a film that aren't just the story and <laughs> so many complaints out there i don't it just it's frustrating okay so that was todd mm-hmm. yeah you're up yeah. i should have said i remember going to um to um drive-ins when I was young, uh, mainly because you, even though you're supposed to be 18, they never checked your IDs. So yeah. you'd see these R-rated films and things, and you go for the sex and everything, uh, even though you're underage. And it was just a thing you did every weekend. That's where I saw one of the worst films ever made, Myra Breckenridge. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so that actually brings back memories going to the drive-in. I actually did that. Uh, so I guess it's my turn, right? And I'm going spaghetti western. This is uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, directed by Sergio Leone, with Clint Eastwood as the good, Lee Van Cleef as the bad, and Eli Wallach as the ugly. I wonder how Eli Wallach felt about that. Um, and it's it's basically inspired by. The Partner's Tale and Treasure of Sierra Madre. You have all these people uh, hunting for a treasure of gold. Um, it was, I guess, you know, it was such a huge hit in the U.S. that made Clint Eastwood a star. It also changed something with how, with ratings, and that it used to be, at least in the U.S., but I think everywhere, you couldn't see someone shoot a gun and the person get hit in the same scene. You had to cut away uh, after the shot and then cut away and then you saw the guy get hit. And this is like the first movie where no, the guy shoots and you see him get hit. And Clint Eastwood said that kind of changed everything. And now things were filmed. Um, I love the Sergio Leone films. Um, And for those who like this one, I highly recommend South Korea's Ji Woon Kim's remake Called the good, the bad, and the weird. That rules. Oh, yeah. I yeah. love that movie. Love that I, movie. Yes. Um, it's wild. I understand they call it the good, the bad, and the weird because they couldn't get the copyright or they couldn't get permission to, to call it that. But uh, that's my fourth choice. I'm sure I mean, a lot of you have seen this. 
Yeah, you oh, can't yes. go wrong with this one. I was happy to see it at the Chinese theater, the Grauman's Chinese. But sorry, whatever it is now. But the but, um, <laughs> the man's Chinese theater. Um, but uh, it it's such a it's everything. It, it's it's just cinema. Like just watching that movie, it yeah. just there's and it's you know people can argue about length these days, even though everyone seems to be going to three hour movies and being completely fine with that. Uh, but like <laughs> that movie is you know packed and it's a you know dave you know this it's a spaghetti western and <laughs> yeah. like a, an epic one where it's not like momentum is a huge like deal with them they're like no it'll just be long whatever but there's so much like packed into what's happening on frame every scene despite being fairly minimal against leone it's not you know it's not about like let me have a ton of extras and all this stuff <laughs> but it, it's just fun to what it's just fun to be in these worlds with him and I, I had seen Good Bad like early on in my life before I had seen the other two. So when I got a box at the, you know, I watched uh, Fistful of Dollars. I was like, that's good. And I watched for a few dollars more. And I'm like, this movie rules. I love this. Give me more of this Lee Van Cleef all day. And I'm like, watching the third one now again, having these two in context. I'm like, well, <laughs> this is just the best. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Eli Wong's just like, let me come in here and just do a whole thing. And it's just great. It, it's so it's so much fun to watch this movie. And it's so like there's an odd amount of pathos that comes into play, like in the second half between like the Civil War stuff that's taking place. And then just because you form such a bond with Eastwood and Wallach's characters, it's 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 fun. It's a real despite the fact that they still like hate each other. It's just fun to watch. It's, 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 just a, it's a fantastic movie. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, I'm a big, big Leone fan. Um, but yeah, I, I had this down as 1966, but I had just looked it up. And I think in Italy, it was released in like late December 1966 and everywhere else it was 67. So it didn't come up on my when, when I was uh, scrolling through my collection. But yeah, it's it's it, it, yeah, it's it's stunning. I mean, one, Once Upon a Time in the West is my favourite film of all time, but the rest of the Dollars, the Dollars trilogy are just as strong. It's a yeah, I love it. OK, Aaron. So I'm at an impasse here because you chose Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, which is a, like it's 66, 67. I have Blow Up as a potential one to talk about, which says 66, but but it was like it won the Palme d'Or at 67. It's on Ebert's mm. 1967 top 10 list. Like, is that a can I, I do that or can I go with something else? No, you yeah. can't. No, sure. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and blow up. All right. Um. Then I'll just cheat and say that my backup was Samurai Rebellion. Shiro Mifune kills like 40 people in 10 seconds. Oh, it's fucking yeah. cool. Um, so blow up. <laughs> um, uh, my, Michelangelo Antonioni, one of the best director names of all time. Um, this movie I really, really love. Uh, I, I, I'm so happy that I was able to see this before I've seen the other films that it influenced. Because uh, I have no idea how I'd feel otherwise i feel like i'd still recognize this movie as a you know a masterpiece but like having seen this be before i saw blow out and uh, the conversation one of my absolute favorite movies seeing this one which other films at other films that like kind of define like it serves like proto entries of genre you can see not necessarily weaknesses but you can see why other films expanding off of those things can be more highly regarded this one while it serves as this kind of like foundational piece of here's a early depiction of swinging London on film and paranoia and varying other like tropes and stuff you'd see in, in films like the ones I mentioned, among others. This is still just a great version of that kind of story where you have this guy uh, uh, played by David Hemmings, who's a photographer and he's a really hip photographer. He gets all these models to come to his house. He takes pictures of them. And then just him being in nature, he stumbles upon like a couple takes a picture of Vanessa Redgrave, a young Vanessa Redgrave is among them. Uh, he takes a, he takes some pictures and she's freaked out about it. He doesn't know why things occur. But again, it's one of these movies where there's just a lot of stuff happening, but not a lot of plot. But eventually some kind of a plot sort of occurs where he sees in his picture as he blows it up that there's perhaps something seedy that's happened that's taken place. Um, and he's trying to get to the bottom of that. And then he gets... Just other things happen to kind of either verify his thoughts or mix them up even more. And then by the end, it goes into this like surreal direction that I absolutely love. Uh, this movie is wonderfully filmed. Again, it's another like outside of Italy and France, like seeing color in movies is there's 
there are choices being made, but the, like with Antonioni, it's like he knows what he's doing. Like it looks fantastic. He, David Hemmings drive, drives around in this was like a Rolls Royce, and it looks wonderful. <laughs> it's great. There's all these cool photography scenes of him like just being what you would now think is like a cliche of a photographer. But at that time, it's like, this is just what it is, apparently. Because uh, it's like the first time we're seeing it. Uh, that stuff is really just fun and interesting. There's like scenes of, I love scenes in like the 60s and 70s of people that just walk into bars or nightclubs and you get extended montages of just the band playing. And this is one of those movies, like the Yardbirds is in this like early on in their career. And it just get to like observe people just hanging out in the club, enjoying the music instead of being like, and now let's talk about the plot. Well, the band plays in the background. It's just like, no, let's just hang out here. This is fun. Uh, the mod subculture is just really on display throughout here. It's fun to see. It's a very stylish film. There's a lot of experimental ideas going on. Um, there's a level of suspense that you might not see coming uh, that kind of puts it in the realm of know, like a like a like a Hitchcock, I guess, but like not because it's just like, it's too plotless to have that kind of a thing, but it's still, there's an inherent quality of like, Oh, what's going to happen here? They go on. So no, I, I'm a big fan of blow up. I'm happy to have seen it multiple times at this point. And yeah, it's a, it's a great movie. I have a weird relationship with blow up. I saw it in college. I didn't like it. And then I saw it like two other times, still didn't like it. By the fourth time I saw it, I had what, what a friend of mine called, making peace with things that don't work in a movie. <laughs> and there are two things that just don't work for me in this movie that I don't buy. And the first one is when Vanessa Redgrave comes to get the pictures, you know, the central character, what's her name, the photographer, acts like there's something odd about this and wonder what's going on. I'm going, there's nothing going on. She's, you took a picture of her with someone who wasn't her husband. She's acting very, very logical. There is nothing illogical or strange about what is going on here. The second thing is when he sees something in the photo and I'm going, nobody, you're not Superman. Nobody has that good an eyesight. There is absolutely no way you saw anything remotely suspicious. You're not a photographer, Howard. You don't know. (laughs) You don't have the eye like he does. (laughs) The photograph is just too small. He wouldn't be able to see something unless it was really blown up. So I've never bought that. But if you can put those two things aside, which I now have, it's, it's an incredibly beautiful movie. It's very existential, so it's really up my alley. Because by the end, you know, it's like La Ventura. There's no resolution. But... That's what life is like. There's no resolution to these things in life. We don't know why they happen. We don't know uh, the ultimate cause. We don't know the ultimate meaning. So, you know, we start hearing the tennis ball instead of just seeing a pretend tennis game. We actually start hearing the tennis ball because that's what life is like. I, I love that ending. That's one of my favorite endings in, in movies. They're just the when the sound starts coming, it's like, that's cool. That's a cool, like and when I'm seeing that, even I'm seeing this early college years. I'm like, well, that's fun. Like, that's, that's a, that's a cool way to go. I, I haven't seen something like that before. I th- also, I thought you were going to say that you hate mimes and that's the reason you don't like this movie. <laughs> no, no, they were fine. Um, <laughs> those kind of mimes for me, but you know, the, the Marcel Marcel, I'm over Marcel Marcel, but, uh, yeah, but this one has a truckload of mimes. So I mean, the more yes. the more the the more the mimier, as I say. <laughs> um, anybody else seen the film? I haven't. It's a list of shame for me. It's one I've keep yeah, wanting to. I've, I've seen the conversation. I've seen blow blow out and stuff. I just, I, I and I love both of them. So I, I'm keen to see it, and I just haven't got around to it. So, yeah. It's a very, I think, important film. Uh, because of its introduction of ex- it and of in, in La Ventura's introduction of existentialism into the American uh, culture, into the American movie culture. Because after this, yeah, you, you just uh, bad guys get away with things. Things happen that don't fully get explained. And it gets really, you know, we adopt we adapt a lot of that uh, existentialism. Boy, I'm getting really, really brainy about these films today. So, <laughs> 
I, 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 um, I'm happy that I've purposely chosen films that are set in London that Dave hasn't seen just to, just to shame him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, but to be honest, you... I think weirdly I always had something against British films when I was when I was first getting into cinema. I think British cinema annoyed me because so much of it was kitchen sink dramas uh-huh. and period dramas. And I hated them both. I was like, oh, I don't want to see misery porn. I don't want to see a load of people dressed up in fancy costumes in expensive houses, um, sipping tea or whatever. It's, it's screw that. So I, I, I did kind of rebelled against that and wanted to watch films from elsewhere. Um, but these days, I'm kind of going back. I'm starting to appreciate more of. I've, I've been delving into some of the kind of British new wave movies and things like that. And uh, but uh, but there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of gaps to plug. <laughs> Yeah, the life and death of Colonel Blimp, more like the life and death of me not watching this movie. Damn. <laughs> yeah. oh, 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 Power of Pressburger, Power of Pressburger, though that is the uh, I, I do I've always I do like them. Although I must admit I haven't got around to Blimp yet because it's so long. <laughs> but um, but yeah, matter of life and death. And, if uh, more like oh, if yeah. I chose not to watch this, I'll do something else. <laughs> 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 To be fair, I'm half American. I blame my mum. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been doing this episode longer than the runtime of La Samurai because it's over. <laughs> <laughs> and it will be regarded as just as much of a classic as La Samurai. Yes. I'm sure. Yes. Oh, this episode's going to be an all-timer, guaranteed. <laughs> Jay who that's what they'll say after they listen to yeah, this episode no. oh, we've been saying that for, we were saying that while he was still host no. <laughs> <laughs> I kid I kid I was going to be curious what Richard would have picked too oh well I can tell I, I, it's funny as I was looking through I was like oh Richard will pick that Richard will pick that you know like there's a Bond film that year even though it's you only live twice I'm like Richard would have it on his list because that's, good. that's a good Bond movie. Yeah, I, yeah, like I mean, you know, it's got a great. Even Dave likes it. He hates. He hates England at this time. <laughs> oh no, I love Bond. I love Bond. <laughs> cool, cool Hand Luke would be on Richard's list. I can guarantee that. I think Point Blank would be on Richard's list, which I can't argue with that one either. Yeah, if I wanted to do, I'm not saying generic. If I wanted to do like a list of the popular things, like easy, easily, these would be oh, on my <laughs> list. Like these are great movies. I love these. Yeah. Like literally the second we got 67, like it's gonna take so much for me not to be talking about Cool Hand Luke or In the Heat of the Night. I'm just like, mm-hmm. like yeah. let me see what else I can do here. In the Heat of the Night, the long-running television series, you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I watched all 200 episodes uh, in preparation. Yeah. <laughs> in the Heat of the Night, which has one of my favorite scenes in film history, when when Cindy Poitier slaps the guy in the greenhouse, I'm like. Yes, yeah. Sydney, do it. <laughs> Have you seen either me... of the sequels? I've seen both of the sequels. I, oh, I, see, I, I, I have the... only seen. Uh, oh, oh I'm forgetting. I haven't seen Mr. Tibbs. I've seen the, the other one. The conf- it's like the Conformer or something like that. Ah, oh, yeah, I'm forgetting the name right now. It does. It starts with a C. I know that. Well, the Conformist is literally a movie, so that's not it. What's the? What's no, the... Not that. <laughs> I only saw. In the, the night of the first time, I think last year, and I was really late to it, but it's oh, yeah, it is it is a fantastic film. I, I love that the organization. There it is. Oh, that's yeah. it. Doesn't um, start with the C at all. No, yeah, the yeah. organization. Okay. I, I I didn't like I didn't realize until way later that it was a series of movies, and it's like oh wow, like no. Sidney Poitier was yeah. not just a movie star, but he had a fucking franchise to himself. Yeah. And that's so <laughs> for a, like a black actor in the '60s, '70s, has like his, outside of Richard Roundtree, it's like he had a franchise yeah. to go for. That's great. And it's the last kind of film you'd expect a franchise from. It doesn't it exactly yeah. complete. It's <laughs> yeah. just yeah. It's, the okay. story's so one off, and then it's like, no, we can keep Tibbs going. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're at David. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm for my doing much better now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my for okay for my final pick, as I said, I veered away. I, I had planned. I I had five spaghetti westerns picked out. There was another Django one in there that I was going to watch, and then I was sent something to review, uh, and. I loved it. And I was like, no, I've got to talk about this because it's one of these films where nobody's heard of it. And I loved it so much. I kind of want to spread the word. So I had to throw this in there. Uh, and that's a film called Happy End or. No, I, actually, no, I'm not going to try and pronounce it. The Czechoslovakian title. But yeah, this is a Czech, Czechoslovakian film by Aldrich Slipsky. 
Um, and in Czechoslovakia around 67, you've got um, a lot of the Czech New Wave films out coming out, some really big, uh, fantastic uh, Czech films. Uh, but this isn't really classed as the, the Czech New Wave because Lipsky had been making films since the 50s. So he's, he's ca- technically kind of the old guard. Um, but this is every bit as kind of, well, it's, it's more out there than a lot of the Czech New Wave films. Uh, so Happy End, the way Happy End works is... It opens with um, whilst the credits are running, you you start to see it, it kind of jigsaw style. Can't you see this image coming together, and you realise it's a man's uh, a man's head that's been taken off his body, and uh, then it comes back and uh, it goes from there. You basically you go backwards. The entire film plays backwards um, from this man's death to his birth, um, completely in reverse. And uh, you realise that this man, he's a butcher. He's played by Vladimir Mensik, and he murders his wife uh, and his and her lover because he caught them. He caught them ha- um, having an affair, so he he murders them, and that's why he's executed. And uh, the film plays all of that situation backwards, but in playing it backwards, it turns this kind of uh, uh, this murderer in it, it, this story of murder into something. A bizarrely kind of wholesome and uh it's it just mines every little bit of humor it possibly can out of this bizarre kind of reversal of of the situation um and it is an absolute absolute joy a lot of the jokes come from uh, a lot of the jokes come from the there's a voiceover um running throughout kind of explaining what's going on but it's explaining things as though the reverse is the norm so uh, he talks about at the beginning when he's he's taken from his execution which he calls his birth he's taken to prison and to him prison is school and he's like telling about how he learned all these things and uh and uh, like he's, he's he's stitching together um uh potato sacks is his job in prison he's like he learned how to um un kind of uh, tear open all these potato sacks and um he's usually you, you kind of give you, you what you whatever items you've got on you, you give away when you go to prison but he he's like coming out of prison and they give him loads of stuff but then one of the things that they give him he's given a suitcase and he says he's given a wife to assemble so he takes his dismembered wife in a suitcase and reassembles her and he's like wow they've given me a, a wife after i left school and um it kind of goes on from there and it's just it's utterly bizarre and uh, another aspect of the humour comes from things playing out in reverse, um, and it's all done very, very cleverly. It's not the it's it's not the first film to kind of play with play with the reverse chronology like this, but it's and and it wasn't the last. Uh, but it just does it so well. Um, there are some obvious bits where uh, just just the quirky quirky things like seeing someone eat backwards, which is kind of gross but kind of funny at the same time, <laughs> and. Um, uh it just really it, it's it's yeah it just had me laughing out loud uh more than i've had in a film for a long long time um it, it got criticized when it first came out thinking that it was a bit of a one-trick pony and uh, especially because at the time there was all the check new wave com- films coming out that were um getting garnering all the attention uh, and this was seen more of a, a bit of a throwaway kind of uh one joke film and in a, in a sense, I agree. It is it is a one trip pony in terms of it is just purely mining everything it can from this premise, but it does it so well and it's furiously paced. Um, it's um, which could be too much. It could prove to be too much um, because it's so fast paced and because it's it's kind of uh, doing one thing in in a variety of ways. But it's very short. It's seventy three minutes. You don't have time to get bored. It just fires and fires and fires, um, and it's just utter sheer joy um that i would yeah highly recommend anyone check it out really um brilliantly made hilariously funny and very clever and doing yeah. the kind of back backwards thing long time before memento and and christopher nolan's kind of uh movies it's uh, yeah I, I have heard of this movie um Excellent. and and, uh, and i've been I've seen a few Czech New Wave films. I'm always like, I want to see more of these because this just seems like mm. so interesting to me. It, you said you had you got this to review. Like, is it on a new Blu-ray or is it on like a set or something? Or? Yeah, it's just been released in the UK by Second Run um, on Blu-ray. Uh, yes, it's d- definitely worth picking up. Uh, it's got I have all region player because I'm all about like just getting stuff that I can that's like cool and obscure. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah go for it. I think it's out now. Yeah, yeah, it came out at the end of March. So yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely out now. 
And now when you say sounds- when you say reverse mm-hmm. chronology, is it like literally like people walking backwards or like me- memento as far as you oh, see yeah. segments? And- no, no. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't explain it clearly enough. But yeah, it it, it is the movements are properly re- all the movements are reversed. Everything okay. is, is reversed. But <laughs> The difference is, and this is another thing, another part of the comedy that I didn't mention, I, uh, is um, is the, but the dialogue isn't, the dialogue is, the dialogue is, but the words make sense, but what it does is it breaks it into sentences and plays the sentence, play, sorry, it plays the lines backwards. Uh, and there's loads of humour kind of brought from this. So um, the conversations run in reverse. So, for instance, uh, I'd written one out somewhere. I'm just looking at my review now. Reminded like the the David Lynch Red Room, but it's funny this time. That's that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so oh, I've written it out somewhere. Sorry, bear with me a second. Oh yeah. So so when he's at trial, uh, this butcher, uh, he's asked um, who put the corpse in your suitcase, and he just replies, the judge. Because he's obviously in reality he's answering something that was said before, but um, in this reverse chronology, it just and it plays with that all the time. The script is must have been painstakingly put together because <laughs> almost every line is some kind of gag because because of the way it plays out and the the way it goes in reverse. Um, so it's just as I say, meticulously put together, but very 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 funny. Um, it sounds like a film I really would like to see. It reminds me of a book, Time's Era, by Martin Amos, in yeah. which at first you're reading this book and you think there's something off. And you finally figure out, oh, this is going in reverse chronological order, but, you know, not like scenes. I mean, it is going backwards in time. And it's really interesting. And then it gets to the Holocaust. And you realize that the central character was the doctor at uh, at a concentration camp. But now, instead of killing Jews, they're putting ashes in ovens and giving birth to Jews. And when you die, you die by entering your mother's womb. And everything's and it's just shattering when that sort of thing starts happening so it's a great idea there have been other things that have been in reverse order but not quite like that like merrily we were along from the 1920s is told in reverse yeah uh order but it's and uh betrayal is from reverse order but each scene goes forward and is uh done chronologically forward that sounds great i i can't wait to see hopefully it'll come up on criterion sometime yeah, hopefully it's been picked up because it's been like kind of restored, and uh, that's why this Blu-ray's come out. So I'm sure it'll be yeah, doing the rounds stateside. Yeah, it's a region it's free. Well. It's a region free Blu-ray as well, the one that's come out in the UK. Ooh. So you like, I'll rush into getting it, then I Criterion or Arrow or like a month later <laughs> yeah, yeah, and be yeah, like, yeah. guess what we got, guys? And I'm like, ah, oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Todd, this is it. This is it. This is the biggie. Well, Take so. Away. Uh, of course, we covered a lot of uh, genres that were frequent in the drive-ins, uh, but we haven't done a horror film yet. So we're going to end with so we're going to end with uh, Jack Kill's disturbing uh, but also playful horror film, Spider Baby, um, yeah. <laughs> which is a creepy tale of a family of young adults who suffer from a condition where they basically all have the minds of children and that is played out in deadly ways. Um, They are all living in their mansion under the care of their loyal chauffeur played by Lon Chaney Jr. Um, The children, (laughs) the quote unquote children in this are played by Sid Haig, Jill Banner and Beverly Washburn, and they all turn in wonderfully creepy performances, especially Jill Banner, who delivers one of those kind of disturbing but sexy type performances. Uh, Sid Haig, also a real standout here. Um, But I can't skip over Lon Chaney Jr., uh, who, you know, he was just he he was one of those actors that, you know, he was in a lot of these horror movies and had a way of bringing characters that were monsters but were sympathetic that you couldn't help but feel for this guy and he brings great heart to this film you really feel for him even though he is involved in some pretty awful things um it it's a film that has great visual style beautiful 
uh, black and white photography. And it's such that it's, you know, it's one of those films that makes really ugly things beautiful <laughs> the way that it, it uh, photographs it. Um, it. It gets pretty dark and unsettling, but it's also got an undeniable sense of humor to it. Um, just a, a film that I, it really surprised me when I watched it because this is one of those films that you can find everywhere. You know, you can find it in bad copies on YouTube and things like that. And, you know, people, I I've seen videos where people like ranked this as one of the worst movies ever made. And I, after I watched that video, I said, the people that put this together obviously did not watch this film because this is, this is a wonderful, uh, you know, just kind of weird, creepy film that also has a weird humorous streak to it. Also quite influential. I mean, you watch this and you can see echoes of it in, you know, things like Texas Chainsaw Massacre or things like that Rob Zombie did, uh, you know, it just, you know, the, the creepy family <laughs> doing weird type of stuff. Um, I, I just really was was charmed by this strange little horror film. He says Mantan Moreland in it. How was he? Yes, did he, he is. <laughs> did he do one of his routines or was he just uh, acting? No, he's film? he. Uh, He's just acting in it. He's uh, he plays, if I remember correctly, a a messenger who uh, unfortunately doesn't make it very long in the film. Oh. <laughs> As messengers often don't. Yeah. But he's very funny, and especially in the he's much better than Step and Fetch it was for the Charlie Chan films. So I guess that leaves me, doesn't it? It does. And I have to go to my thing here. Um, this should be no surprise since we sort of talked since I uh, pineapple kiosk or kiosk it early, whatever the verb form of pineapple kiosk is. And it is Playtime, which is one of the great French films. It's from French filmmaker Jacques Tati. It's one of the great farces of all times. Uh, it stars Tati as Monsieur Hulot. Who uh, Tati plays in a large number of his films. Uh, there's not a lot of plot. Uh, Hulot arrives in Paris and he cures, I think he's trying to find a friend or find an address, but he curiously wanders around this new high tech Paris uh, along with a, a group of American tourists. And there's also this nightclub restaurant that prepares its. It's getting ready for opening night, but it's still under construction. And it all converges in this just riotous ending. Um, as I said, it's a bit difficult to explain because there really isn't much of a plot. It's just this, all these visuals and these little set pieces and the way that Hulot looks at Paris. It just Paris just doesn't look like I mean, it just has a very every everything is very funny. The way he looks at it, the sounds, everything is just very funny. So um, I think it's one of the great farces. I think it's one of the great French films. Certainly, Tati is probably his greatest film. I saw a restored version of it. I can't remember how long ago, and it was just incredibly gorgeous uh, to look at. Yeah, as I was a. Uh... So early on, I've been wanting to see this film for such a long time, and I, I try to see films like this the way I, the best way I can, whether it's like Lawrence of Arabia or something, where it's like, I want to watch this in the 70 millimeter format that he purposely made this film in, which possibly led to its demise at the box office. <laughs> um, but I, you know, just seeing it on the fancy Blu ray it has uh, from Greg Carrion on my large TV, it did the job because this film is wonderfully enormous. Like the, the idea of building this just massive set to, contain so much uh like basically like vignettes um and play with art style and varying forms of comedy i i just i, I really like i knew this would be completely my speed and i was very happy that it delivered on that i love that it's like it feels like a silent film that's not as far as much like you know with that t's kind of humor like the dialogue's not important at all and it's there's so much, you know, there's music and there's physical comedy playing out. So it's not like you need words to really tell the story that's going on here. So it has this sort of, I don't even know what the term would be, like post-silent film, silent film thing going for it, where it just has like a different kind of approach. In silent film time, these were called sound films, but 
uh, because there was a film that had sound to it. But you're right. I mean, the dialogue is pretty much unintelligible and there's not much of it. And it's not supposed to be intelligible. I mean, it's you're right. It's it's beside the point. Yeah. You know? And it and the use of color is really interesting, too, where it's shot in a way so, where it's so it's drab, not drab, but it's like it's a lot of non primaries on purpose. So you can have highlights and scenes where there are primary colors and things being used like that. So it it, it has a a very deliberate look to it that I appreciated as well. For example, uh, one of the earliest the scenes, it's a very small scene. Hilo arrives somewhere, I can't remember if it's at the airport or if it's at a business, and two nuns just walk down, and you kind of hear their their headgear a little flapping, and they're bouncing, and it's just funny. It's not plot. <laughs> it's not take the story anywhere. It's just so funny. So, And the whole movie is sort of like that. He just finds humor in all sorts of things. For sure. Um, I think that's it. So at this time, uh, th- that is it, right? I, we've got everybody, everything's done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So at this time, we shall take a short break and listen to a promo for a sister podcast. Listen up, ladies and gentlemen. Our podcast, The One-Armed Bennett, will cover all 130 minutes of the classic 1993 action thriller, The Fugitive, three minutes per week. Average length of each episode, including guests, is approximately 30 minutes, giving us a total expected running time of 65 hours. So what we want out of each and every one of you is to listen along with us for the next year to our hard target search through every plot detail, character breakdown, guest segment, Movie trope, Star Trek reference, and corny joke in each minute. Episodes go up starting on January 1st. So please stay subscribed and recommend this podcast to all your movie-loving friends. Your podcast name is The One-Armed Minute. Now go listen. Well, welcome back. And uh, we are going to start closing out. The exit question today was, um, which movie from 1967 would you like to... would you think should or could be or would like to see remade and bonus points for director and actors. So whoever wants to jump in, jump in. Well, um, obviously Michael Bay's young girls of Rochefort would be uh, fantastic. I, I, uh, <laughs> with uh, Shia LaBeouf All the in his bag on the head. The era. End. <laughs> um, I have a pick um, that I, I okay. that is just as good. Um, as people may know, I'm a very big Godzilla fan. Son of Godzilla came out in 1967. Um, yes. And because it's one of the, what I would say, the lesser Godzilla films, even in the <laughs> Showa era, um, I would say naturally that means that's the one you remake. And Godzilla's so prolific right now um, between his his recent Oscar win, his new blockbuster, and his TV series, a real rhythm of Renaissance Lizard, as they call him. Um, I think Son of Godzilla will be the next logical step. And who better to do that than a director that handles daddy issues all the time? That's right, Steven Spielberg, who's always wanted to make a Godzilla movie. Uh, put him on board. And who do you get to play these characters? Well, he's been working with Mark Rylance a lot. He literally played the BFG, so that just makes sense. Be Godzilla, Mark Rylance. There you go. He's oh, a dad yeah. now. Mark Rylance. He's you know he's a great actor. And I mean, just keep it like British, I guess. So like, get Barry Keoghan in there. He could be the son of Godzilla. It's two of them. Yeah. And, the the set the set pics alone of them in like blue stockings with dots all over them would be phenomenal. <laughs> that'd, be the, that'd be the best. <laughs> um, make it a, you know a story about like Godzilla's like a bad dad. He's like, oh dad, you went and trashed the city again, and his son's just angry at him. And he's like, but you got to learn how to be angry too, son. And he teaches him how to stomp over cities and fight, you know, a lobster or like a giant spider or caramungus or whatever. It'd be great. I feel like this the monsterverse. I'm writing letters. We're, we're seeing what Legendary is going to do with this. Oh. Get the beard on board. I'm, I think this will work. You know, you had a, you had a, not, I guess, exactly a son of Kong, but a baby Kong in 
Godzilla times Kong. It's so, the you know, natural next step. Like, exactly. Like, I, I, I don't want to do it. <laughs> I, I was sense. kind of, I was kind of disappointed that there wasn't a baby Godzilla in that, that new film. I was they're, like, they're gonna, saving it for naturally this brilliant idea that I'm proposing for them. Like, it's going to happen. There's going to be a labor scene in the Coliseum. It'll be great. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's how it'll start with the labor scene. Yeah. <laughs> really get you on Cod Godzilla's side. Like, oh, his mom died. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's great. Anybody else? Well, um, I, I I struggled with this, and I just decided to go with the first thing that kind of made me chuckle when it went through my mind. Hear me out here, folks. I know it's. It'd be controversial to replace uh, the king, Elvis Presley, but hear me out. Ryan Gosling in Clambake. Boom. Prince. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. he could totally, totally be, be better it, already. Just the casting alone <laughs> makes hey, it a better movie. I think Elvis movies are goofy fun. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, Gosling could totally be the heir of an oil empire who goes to Florida to become a water ski instructor. I mean, you know, come on. Clem Bake is keep the same theme song. It's a great theme song, you know. Oh, oh try, just take a giant poster that says Gosling in Clam Bake. Clam Bake. Oh, yes. my God. <laughs> the marquees would just literally get set on fire. And he can sing and dance. Because yeah, he grew absolutely. up. Absolutely. I, this is Singing a completely serious pitch I'm hearing from Todd. I'm not, there's no sarcasm right. in this whatsoever. No, absolutely not. No, I I am on board. I think these are both great ideas. Th- thank you, Howard. Uh, uh, did you have one, David? Uh, I did. I've not put as much thought into mine, but because uh, I was I was out today and just saw the message before the podcast. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to go with... That. I've spent a whole podcast without talking about any like martial arts movies. So, <laughs> so I'm going to throw in, there's a, a classic uh, Wuxia from 1967 is the one arm swordsman. And back after, straight after that was released, um, Jimmy Wang Yu himself, who was the star of that film made, he made two sequels and he made dozens of ripoff semi sequels. He made loads of one arm swordsman theme type films within the space of a few years, but then they dried up. Sui Hark made the blade, which is a, which is kind of a remake, but, but there's not been one for a while. So I figure let's bring the one arm swordsman idea back. And if we're thinking of modern kind of action director, star duos, it's gotta be Chad Staheleski or however you pronounce it. And Keanu Reeves, um, uh, doing doing the new one arm swordsman. I, I think you can't go wrong with that. Not into it. Does he talk yeah. much? If he doesn't talk much, then Connor Reeves would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can change it up. You can <laughs> keep his mouth shut in this one. He's not exactly <laughs> super verbose in the past several action movies he's done. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, that sounds great. Yeah, I could see that actually. I could see uh, Connor Reeves as a just kill his dog and, and take his arm away and he'll come <laughs> yeah. after you. <laughs> come get revenge. But yes, well, learn the choice. skills of one-armed weaponry. <laughs> yeah. And and his dog is only uh, as as only three legs. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, well that that maybe his own arm hasn't lost its dog's leg. <laughs> yeah. I like it. <laughs> uh, my choice is going to be Jean Luc Godard's weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're gonna put it in Los Angeles. It's going to star Tom Hardy and Charlize Theron, and it's going to be <laughs> directed it. by yeah, it's going to be directed by David Lynch. Oh boy! Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> On board. We could go with George Miller, but I I think I'd rather go, especially in the second half. Maybe George Miller could do the first half, and David Lynch could do the second half. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah. Laura, Laura Dern's going to have a field day as a cameo in this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, well, now we are closing out, so we need to find out what is happening in your guys' uh, life and what you are promoting. So, Aaron. Okay. I uh, host a podcast called Out Now with Aaron and Abe. We talk about the weekly movie releases, and we do a lot of fun bonus stuff as well. Uh, that includes commentary tracks every month, and we have our upcoming summer movie Gamble, where we'll be predicting the top 10 highest grossing films of the summer, which is a lot of fun and very competitive. Um, I am the editor-in-chief over at We Live Entertainment, where I write my movie reviews. I also write reviews for Why So Blue for Blu-ray and Criterion Reviews, 
and I'm on all the socials at Aaron's PS4. Fantastic. Uh, David? Uh, well, the big thing, I don't think I've plugged this on a Lamcast yet, because, but um, I have uh, actually resurrected the Blueprint Review podcast. It disappeared for, oh, I don't know, five, six years, and uh, I have just decided to resurrect it this year and I'm two episodes in so far so I'm I'm on a, a very small roll <laughs> and I'm hoping to do it monthly and it's a very loose conversation uh, just about what we've been watching from our kind of blu-ray collections and I, I bring on another couple of writers and uh, and we just just chat movies uh, very loose very straightforward but um hopefully a, a good listen so yeah check who, it out who, who was on the most recent episode Oh, it was Jay. Jay oh, that was it. it was, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jay, Jay flew Leon Vegas. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I, it's, I, I, I'm mixing it up a little bit each week. There's different. It depends who's around. Um, because I've got quite a, a large pool of writers on Blueprint Review. Um, uh, but but yeah, Jay Jay showed up this this month, and hopefully he'll be on the uh, future episodes if I didn't put him off. <laughs> we haven't lost Todd again, have we? No, I I'm here. Todd. Oh, sure, oh. turn. What's going on? Tell us everything. So, my podcast is the Forgotten Film Cast, and uh, we're releasing episodes all the time. Uh, some of the most recent ones, we did an episode on Clint Eastwood's The Gauntlet. Uh, last week, I was joined by Jason Soto to discuss a film from 1999 called The 13th Floor. Um <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this uh, we, we actually I, I think we're not going to have an episode this week because just some scheduling things didn't work out. But hopefully we'll be recording soon about a yet another kind of satanic panic film from the 70s to the devil, a daughter. And uh, and Howard's going to be on soon. We're going to be talking about the rosary murders. So that's coming up soon. Yeah, we have that of the 19th, I think you said. Yeah, yeah. later this week we're recording. Yeah, and forgotten film from I think it's Canadian, but it has Donald Sutherland and Charles Durning in it. So hopefully it's still as entertaining like I remember when I first saw it, but you never know. But I'm looking forward to that. Um, we did the Gauntlet on pop art. We combined it with uh, the Hitman's Bodyguard hmm. um, about someone trying to get a witness from place to place. Mine really hasn't changed yet. I meant to get the Valentine's Day episode on Friday, up on Friday, but um, it um, didn't happen, though it's all done. I just have to upload it, and it's with Richard Kirkham, uh, who is not here today, and it's Ghost and Truly Madly Deeply, uh, about two people who come back uh, from the dead uh, to interact with their loved ones, whether you want them to or not. Then uh, we have the Vern where we did May, December, and A Dream of Passion, two films about actors who go, uh, who need help doing their parts, so they seek out um, someone similar uh, or something similar to help them uh, achieve that. And then uh, Todd, uh, I have the fantastic Mr. Fox and Straight Time to start working on, which is about two uh, ex-cons trying to go straight. So with that, I want to thank all of you for coming on to the show, uh, all you youngsters and um, everybody out there. Uh, this was the Lamcast. Have a great week. You've been listening to the Lamcast. If you have an idea for a show or would like to join us on the Lambcast, contact us at largeassmovieblogs.com. Find us on Facebook, just search for Lambcast, or on X, formerly Twitter, at Lambcast. And you can find us on YouTube as well. The Lamb site can be found at largeassmovieblogs.com. We'd also love it if you would leave a review on iTunes. <laughs> it's over! 